Hey guys, my name is Steve Guttenberg and I am the Audiophiliac and today's show is all about a woofer. <laughs> a very, very, very large woofer. The biggest woofer I have ever seen in someone's home. And that someone is the designer, Devin Turnbull. He lives here in Brooklyn. And it's basically a story of how this woofer came into being as a design for his company, OJAS. And well, it's not about home theater. It's not about explosions or special effects or no, it's not really, that's not what this woofer is for. This is a subwoofer. This is a woofer for music. A woofer design, as big as it is, it's designed to disappear, to just let the music come through. And if the music has incredibly deep bass, you're going to hear it, you're going to feel it. So anyway, I, I, I didn't know what I was getting myself into when I went to listen to this woofer. But, well, it was an experience. So anyway, this is me talking with Devin Turnbull. What do you want to talk about today? I think we're going to talk about this, uh, this thing right next to you, this woofer. Okay. It's pretty amazing. I, I didn't know they made woofers this big. So it's, it's 32 inches? It's made by Fostex in Japan. They call it 31 and a half inch, but it's <laughs> 31 and a half is, is the outside of right. the frame, right. the outside of the frame. Right. Um, you know, people uh, always reference the EV30W, the iconic EV30 inch woofer when talking about this. And there's certainly a relationship between the two of them. Um, I've had a few EV30s and I've built enclosures for them and it's another really fun driver, um, but it's it's similar but quite different than this as well. I think it has a power rating of like 20 watts, whereas this can handle 250 watts, 350 watts. What's its sensitivity? 96 dB, I think. Oh, yeah. But I think as we've discussed before, sensitivity is not everything. <laughs> Right. You know, I mean, I, I tend to have a really hard time working with uh, a lot of the kind of like off the shelf contemporary drivers, especially the like higher end pro drivers, because none of them are designed to work with, none of them respect at, you know, uh, below 50 watts, really. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I like to run single end triode amps or triodes in general. And I'm usually working with single digit to low teens of mm -hmm. power. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I think one of the things about there are a lot, there are a lot of really efficient speakers, but if a voice coil can handle 500 Watts or even 150 Watts, the voice coil is quite heavy and with a few Watts, even though you can make, you can make, plenty of sound usually sounds pretty lethargic mm. uh, so I've kind of taken the same approach with this woofer it's not about some people do power these with uh, maybe the transmitting triodes that push pull 845 or something like that you can p triode power an amp a speaker like this but um, I usually like to when a speaker can handle a few hundred watts, I like to give it a few hundred watts. So I'm powering it with a class D subamp, basically. Oh, um, this, this is? This is, yeah. Okay. So this whole system is kind of just bi-amped right now. I use a subwoofer amplifier, like an Ice Power, um, Hypex, whatever, high quality class D amp that has a few hundred watts of power and has a sub crossover active crossover built into it oh. it works great you know i mean so it's, cross a low, it's a low pass low yeah. pass okay. 60 hertz um you know i i tend to take a supplemental approach to subwoofers in general i agree that's not everybody's thing they it's want, not everybody's yeah, thing and, and i don't I, i'm with you on this because i think high passing your main speakers eh, it's kind of dicey <laughs> i look at it i look at it like this like this this formula of, you know, triode amp and a, 
Alltech two-way speaker is something that I have just put my full, uh, I've just gone full trust on that and have appreciated for decades now. Mm. Um, it does, it, it has charm and beauty that I'm just in love with. I don't want to mess with it. So yes, it is limited in its frequency range. Um, there for contemporary music and just the way we're used to listening to music doesn't go quite high enough or low enough. I resisted that sort of fact slash temptation for a long time. I was like, I just want to really know what this speaker does. It does so well, it does so beautifully. And I'm just going to learn to exploit that as much as possible. Just listen to the two way. And I was missing out on a lot. You know, I was listening, I was missing out on a lot of music that you really need deep bass and very high highs to really properly listen to. I mean, I was enjoying a lot of music that I couldn't appreciate as well with a lot of contemporary speakers that, that do, you know, very low bass and very high highs. But, um, yeah, but I think I was also missing out on a lot of records that I knew I loved, but were kind of like lacking that department. So when it came time to, um, when it came time to supplement the speaker, I approached it as just that. Super tweeters with just a high pass mm. and usually just a single cap as a first order. Um, and the tweeter came in at, at what frequency? Eight to 10K. Okay. Um, and so I, I started with, both um, super tweeters and subs. There are quite a few super tweeters that are really popular um, with the sort in this sort of high efficiency world mm -hmm. that um, they're pretty easy to implement. The JBL twenty four oh five oh seven seven, the JBL slot tweeter, and even the baby cheeks are like the classics. Japanese Europeans guys that are running you know anything from Western Electric to Alltech to Tad to exotic high efficiency drivers. Subs are much more difficult to integrate with these kinds of speakers. Um, you know, people often, attributes that people often find attractive about these kinds of speakers is the speed mm. because there's so little actuation happening with all the drivers. Um, you know, X max of like a millimeter or two. The, Cones are barely moving. Okay. Right? So that's what you meant by activation. Activation? Is that what actuation, actuation. Meaning like an actuator that moves things forwards and back. Right. Like excursion. Li linear. Yeah. Excursion being the distance. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, that m forward and backward movement of the cone of the speaker or the diaphragm or whatever it is. Um, you know, if you play these things at full volume and you get right up close, you'll just see the woofer just barely moving, which is very different than, you know, what most people are used to seeing. People will, people will come in here to like, you know, uh, generate some content or whatever. They're like, can I film a video of the woofer like right, in pumping, their head? Pumping away. Because you, you see that it's pretty easy to do with a lot of yeah. speakers that have high excursion woofers. Um, but these, these things just barely move. And, and how low do the, the, they go, the main speakers go? Um, most all tech woofers in a, an appropriate box, like, well, these, the ones you have here, say high forties is probably oh, okay. like realistically okay. like the, the, the limit to most, I mean, this sp specific box, I, I don't know off the top of my head exactly where it's like minus three or minus six or okay. whatever you're going to measure it to. But generally like, uh, uh, the classic high efficiency drivers of this era, 50 Hertz is like the realistic kind of limitation of these types okay. of speakers. Class D amps have made it a lot easier to integrate woofers. Like back in the day, it was very hard to, uh, to integrate subs at all because the crossover and the amplification, there is really no speaker that's going to produce 20 hertz that's 
that, that I'm aware of, mm -hmm. that's like, you know, 100 dB efficiency. Um, so, so... Well, there is one. What is it? <laughs> I haven't heard it. This new Eclipse uh, Jubilee. It's horn loaded and vented. And I just interviewed the designer about that. And he's claiming it goes down to actually 18, was I think the minus 3D point. It's but there, big. there has it's, to be very, some kind of equalization. Oh yeah, yeah. there's DSP. There's exactly. So there's if you're DSP, DSP running, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Um, because you know the vented part of the of of the base that it's reproducing is never going to keep up with the horn loaded part. Okay. Um, I have to hear them, but anyway, just throwing that out there. Sure. Um, yeah. DSP makes a lot of things possible that mm -hmm. uh, that weren't possible in the era of analog. Right. Um, anyway, so you know you can build a conventional subwoofer with a high excursion driver that goes in a pretty small box, and you can get it to play loud enough to keep up with you know a uh, Altec type high efficiency speaker. Because you, you were doing that, right? You, I've done it a lot. Oh, stuff. I've done it a lot. And, yeah. we, and you know, we listen to that. And it, it, it works. But I tend to find... Um, I love having control over subwoofers, right? Um, I love to be able to adjust, uh, you know, the, the level respective to the full range speaker and just turn it on and off. And I found that most of the time no matter what I did with a high excursion sub that required a lot of power, um, is it's really useful for listening to music that, electronic music that sure. sub bass is an absolutely essential part of the music. Right. And you know, if you listen to um, bass music in general, right. um, you know, it makes all the difference in the world. And that music was really recorded and you know, conceptualized for a speaker like that. Yeah. And so it's great. It works. Um, but then when you start playing uh, music that is, um, you know, acoustic music that's more timbral, that is, you know, much more, has much more critical timbral qualities to the bass, those things just sound so woofy, right? Mm. Like, oh, sorry. Um, they sound so like huff, huff and puffing, right? Because mm -hmm. um, there's so much like air movement. You put your hand over the vent uh -huh. and you can, you know, you can feel there's wind. There's wind, <laughs> exactly. Um, and it tends, it tends to be so much slower that suddenly, you know, the difference between a double bass and, a, um, you know, synthesizer is is not as clear mm. as you'd hope. It all starts to just kind of sound like bass, yeah. right? And you can hear the woofer almost always, right? Like any small system um, that has like a dedicated powered sub, high excursion sub in a small box, as soon as, it, as, soon as a bass note hits that's firing that sub, you hear the sub. But you know, there's people yelling at their screens right now saying, well, not if it's crossed over below uh, 80 hertz or 60 hertz, then it's bass is omnidirectional. I always like that, bass sure. is omnidirectional. Sure, it's omnidirectional, this is true, right? The wave <laughs> is 40 feet long right. at 20 hertz. Right. Uh, you know, this room is only 18 feet wall to wall. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you imagine, um, you know, a long frequency wave and you're sitting out in the ocean, you can see a very long period wave but if you then built a wall and you could only see 20 feet in front of you and there are 100 foot long waves coming uh -huh. you just see the water going up and down okay right That's good, I like this, this is where it becomes omnidirectional right where the the wavelength is so long that like your ear can't perceive the direction of the wave um, and uh, so I tend to just switch them off you know, you start listening to jazz, you turn the sub off, uh, and you listen to, you know, the beautiful Altec speaker that that music was probably recorded, mixed, mastered, and reproduced on right. in its golden age. Right. right. right? Um, 
But, you know, even in that context, there's a lot of the music that, um, that benefits tremendously from sub bass. So I had seen this woofer in use in almost exclusively Japanese listening rooms. This, um, this woofer? The Fostex FW800. Okay. Um, it's very, very popular in the oh. Japanese uh, kind of ultra high-end audiophile world. Particularly, you know, MJ Magazine is a huge uh, reference for me. It inspires a lot of, of what I do, the kind of the culture that MJ documents throughout the last many decades, right? Um, and like people will just refer to like the su super woofer. There's really nothing else like in its class. Um, so, so it was designed and conceived as a, an audiophile woofer. It's not for cars. Or, oh no, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's a. It's it's not that kind of design. I've only heard of it being used in these like super high end listening rooms. What, no Japan. home theater. People aren't using them in home theaters and stuff. Uh, it's it's a very musical driver. Okay. Um, you know, in home theater, people just want high output of very low right. frequencies. Right. It, that's not what this is designed to do. Okay. It's not meant to send, you know, like a... A shockwave. Yeah, 120 <laughs> dB of like 18 hertz that you're just like, you know, you feel... Right. It's not supposed to like move the, move the seat under you, mm. but you feel it. And the thing, that, the thing that strikes me the most about this woofer... In, in various implementations that I've heard it in a few now, is that like you don't hear it. Mm. You just hear music that extends down like beyond the audible frequency range. And it's not by my ear, it's not so easy to like hear exactly where it comes and where it's no longer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But here's the thing I'm thinking, you know, Remember that line from Jaws, you need a bigger boat? You know, I think you need a bigger room. Because what you really need, I know people are talking to their screens right now, is, Devin, I have only one. You need two. You need a stereo. I'm building, I'm building a system with two right now. <laughs> it's going to go in a much bigger room than this. Okay. It's going to be at uh, Public Records, the new room we're building upstairs. Okay. Um, and come listen to it when it's done. Okay, when's that? This summer. This summer? Oh, yeah. I got a lot of things that I'm tentatively rolling out this summer. Oh, okay, okay. But yeah, this having uh, stereo subs was another thing that like, yeah. For if, sure. If you're into the, the subwoofer thing, having two is definitely I totally agree. a better way. As much as possible, you know. Yeah, it's I'll, not always possible. Right. right. You I'll incorporate it into in sort room. of like the stack, right? Like mm -hmm. we usually try there, for there to be like, uh, definite point sources where uh -huh. the whole spectrum of sound is coming right. from, whether right. it's two or four or whatever it is, right. um, totally helps. Yeah, it's not subtle. It's not that it. It's not that it goes deeper or plays louder. It just the imaging just because that's the thing about subs that I think is so amazing is it's not just bass. It adds dimensionality and space. The sound staging is completely different when you have a subwoofer well integrated into a system. Everyone has commented that everyone that was familiar with my system prior to this thing being in here, uh -huh. everyone in the first like five minutes is like shocked by how much more coherent the mids are. Uh -huh. The imaging is... Even the highs. And the highs. <laughs> it's just so much more clarity about the positioning of instruments right, right, right. and the depth of the sound stage everything everything just finds their place much better yeah it's so it's so counterintuitive right that yeah. adding a subwoofer would make that do you say yeah bass, it's so okay. striking that i kind of and i'm not an acoustician yeah. right like i don't when people start asking me about room treatments and stuff i'm like talk to a professional right um but i it's so immediately apparent that i often also wonder if just putting a box here would have made a no. significant improvement. No, 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 no. I mean, <laughs> it's so striking though. It's just like high mids, uh -huh. they're becoming so much more holographic. 
And I'm just like, is this just because of the foundation that the sub bass builds to put the mids and highs on? It's, it's pretty Some, amazing. Something like that. I think it is, yeah. So, I mean, this is also a young endeavor, this, this subwoofer. Yeah. You just have this like a couple of months. Ago. I just yeah. built this cabinet a couple of months ago. Um, and I've been experimenting it with a bit, but I've honestly mostly just been enjoying it. It works so well the way we've got it set it up, set up now. Yeah. When I was selling high farm, people would see big speakers the, who weren't familiar with them. The, the, the thing that they always say, almost always said, I bet that plays really loud. Not that it sounded good, just that it would blow you away by how loud it sounds. And, you know, depending on the situation, I'd say, well, yeah, it, it can play really loud, but that's not the main course here. The one that's more counterintuitive that I get all the time is people will see this, you know, sizable speaker and they're like, oh, but you must need a huge amp to, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. for that speaker. Right, right. And I mean, that's just like one of my favorite like gotchas yeah, is yeah, like yeah. my amp is, uh, you know, two watts per channel. <laughs> And then people are just like, their brains melt. Right. They're like, they, they, I, they're, I, I can't what? process that, right. Yeah, yeah. And then, you know, then it's fun to explain to people right. efficiency, right? Like yeah. you have a, a large magnet, you've got a lot of motor strength, you need very little input to get a lot of SPL okay. out of it. Um, and, you know, that's a fun, that's always a fun early talking point with high right. efficiency speakers. So, uh, well, this is, this is definitely keeping you busy. Definitely. <laughs> Definitely. And strong. You don't have to go to the gym, man. You just move this thing around a bit and you're, you're good. Man, yeah. It's, it's, it's taxing. It's, it's not easy. That, uh, that mental picture of you carrying it up the stairs is just terrifying to it me. Was, it was, on, you know. Because you could really hurt yourself. You could die. You could die. You could be crushed by a speaker. You know? If that thing fell, yeah, I don't like to think about that. Yeah. If that thing fell backwards on someone, a few right. hundred pounds, yeah. down the stairs. Tumbling down? Yeah. So you got this gigantic uh, woofer, but you're also working on anything smaller? Are we doing any small stuff right now? Yeah, I mean, we're doing a lot of fun uh, experimenting with the Techniques direct drive, the new oh. flat rotor direct drive motors, as, as we can get our hands on them. Um, that's a smaller thing to work with, which is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, we're working on some new, uh, working on a new phono stage still with Steve. Steve Berger, right. Mm -hmm. Working on a few different versions of that, just trying to like figure out where the right balance of, I don't want to say value engineering, because we're not like value engineering anything, but we're trying different uh, complements of components that are, you know, more and less expensive just to kind of learn about what the options are and mm. find the right price point for it and stuff. Um, we're also working on a parallel single-ended 2A3 based on the uh, MV45 story he wrote for Sound Practices 16. Oh. So that's Wait, a fun... Wait, Steve wrote? Steve Berger? Okay. Yeah. He wrote... Uh, he wrote a, a, a piece called MV40, or I don't know what the piece is called, but it's about a MV45, meaning multi-valve 45, that you could run 45s or 2A3s in. We're just going to build it to run 2A3s. At least that's the plan. In um, parallel. So the output would be like 8, 10 watts or something? 8 watts or so, yeah. Um, which is a lot of single-end triode power. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Um, Probably but sound the, the really nice on my cornwalls. Indeed. <laughs> we'll have to get <laughs> you. A hint we'll have to get you a pair. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'm having a really fun time experimenting with the Techniques motors. That's That's been a really fun project. Uh -huh. So you're going to take that motor and, and put it in a plinth? Wood plinthing. Um, yeah, Techniques, you know, has recently re-released the direct drive turntables and they've come out with three or four different motors that I'm aware of and I've managed to like extract from complete turntables. Oh, they don't sell the motors by themselves. You got to buy the tapes. I, I have been, it, it's hard to get the complete turntables and it's hard to get the replacement parts. And I do have a direct relationship with them, but they're 
thus far not it's it's hard they're they're really uh not able to keep up with demand on all the new turntable stuff um but you know i have been working with the um the 1500c motor the 1200gs motor and um also the 1200g motor which i'm hoping i get my hands on soon um of that group that's the best one yeah okay. um not easy to get though uh but they all my method for integrating them into a wood plinth is the same and i, I think they all have the same like uh, chassis mounts they all mount into the body of the turntable oh. the same way as far as I can tell okay. I haven't gotten my hands on all of them yet but I'm hoping that the uh, I'm hoping that the parts that I make that allow you to kind of retrofit the existing motors into a wood plinth will be universal potentially mm. um, but yeah so I'm kind of hoping to come up with whether there's like kits that you could take your complete turntable and turn it into a Frankenstein super turntable or just be able to kind of produce them as a, you know, product we can offer to some mm. of our that sounds great. customers. It's a really fun project. I bet. I've always loved, you know, building turntables around the Garage 301 mainly, but it's just such a fun, I think for a lot of people, it's a pretty approachable first DIY project. Mm. Um, it's pretty easy to wrap your head around. I mean, especially if you're, if you set up a tone arm and a cartridge and you're like, you kind of have a pretty good understanding of the geometry. Yes. Yeah. But, um, I think it's less complicated than to design and build than a speaker, for example, certainly less than an amplifier. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's cool. I'm certainly on board with that idea. Big time. Going through this turntable, you know. Re reimagining how I, my my life of turntables right now now that, that I have a Technics turntable, a GR, and using the detachable head shell and playing different cartridges, which is just so much fun. Right? Mm -hmm. I didn't see that coming. You know, I did it like because I wanted to review a bunch of cartridges, and then I realized after I had done the review, I was still doing it. I was still trying all these different things, and yeah. you know, like the Ortofon SPU thing wouldn't have happened otherwise. So I mean, even if you have two tone arms set up. You have to be able to, you know, swap cartridges with a in a reasonable amount of time without, you know, like uh, the fixed head shell thing for me would never work. Right. You said you never had one with a head, fixed. I haven't head had. I, I had a. I had a SME thirty twelve. I think my first twelve inch tone arm. I I, I had a, either a three zero zero nine or a or a thirty twelve. Um, with a fixed head shell, SME made. It's funny because people refer to that as the SME standard, the the the, the mounting collar. Uh -huh. um, but they did make versions of those classic SME arms with fixed head shells, and I know I had one of those. But I haven't had a, I haven't had a fixed head shell in at least fifteen years. Uh -huh. It's just wow. too. I mean, mainly because I've primarily run SPUs, but I also uh, it's just. It's just too tempting to be able to change cartridges <laughs> yeah. to suit your mood. You can't go back, is basically, right? Once you've had that flexibility, you don't want to live without it. That's what I'm going through right now. I mean, I understand, obviously, I understand the advantage of if you just were going to set up one cartridge, yeah. never change it, and listen to that thing forever. Yeah, I understand, obviously, having a direct wire from the head shell leads potentially all the way to the input to the phono stage. That's oh, yeah. obvious, but the flexibility that you lose is just totally not worth it to right. me. Um, totally on board. I'm coming late to this uh, awareness, but that's where I'm at, definitely. Are you going to have some guy that's going to be like, no way. Yes, you're wrong. So uh, back to woofers. So you're going to make like an 18-inch version? A baby uh, one? I mean, I've made a lot of 18-inch... I've made a lot of 18 inch subs in my day, but I don't know of a low excursion 18 inch woofer. Uh -huh. I would love to work with Fostex on an 18 inch version of this woofer. Uh -huh. um, I mean, there are, there are 18 inch low excursion 
woofers they're not subs you know mid bass drivers for sure um but wait 18 inch mid bass drivers yeah 18 inch woofers that aren't subs yeah oh, okay well why wouldn't that work for you well they don't play down low enough to be oh, considered okay. a sub oh, i mean I okay. um there are plenty of good 18s um but all the subs that i've come across there's they still want to do a lot of that okay, okay. movement um so they don't have this like effortless minimal amount of yeah. uh of movement yeah so i mean i would love to work with fostex on an 18 inch version of this driver yeah, yeah yeah it's a very expensive driver you know i don't know if there's any way of getting around that uh i know it's handmade and made to order and it's made in japan made in Japan, made to order by hand, and, uh, you know, just isn't the, I, I, they just don't make very many of them. Mm. Um, and I don't know if there's any way to improve on that, but... Um, Are you working with them directly through Japan? Is that really the U.S. distributor for this? They do, yeah. Matasound is the distributor oh, of this okay. thing. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think they've had it up on the site forever i've always seen it there as early as i was aware of it you know madison is the fostex distributor in the u.s okay. and you know does a lot to promote fostex and diy audio which is awesome um and you know fostex is probably i mean in terms of my interest in diy fostex is the brand that's done the most to foster that market um and being Japanese, you know, this perspective that I have on hi-fi is very much, you know, they make Elnico magnet versions of most of the drivers. High efficiency is what they do. They're very much like, this is what, this is what they right. do. That's, yeah. Um, so it's a perfect fit for you. Yeah. But I, 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 I uh, yeah, I, I have to kind of just buy this driver more or less the same way everyone else does. <laughs> Right. Um, oh. So, you know, my talking about it and promoting it is really more out of uh, enthusiasm as a as a builder than right. any kind of, if you want to buy the driver, just go, yeah, buy the driver. Yeah. There you go. Knock yourself out. All right. I think we've done it. Awesome. I guess today, Devin Turnbull. Thanks, Steve. Ojas. Always fun. This was great.